ready for the next match. This time it's ZVP, always changing it up. It's gonna be super exciting. Our Zerg player was just on stage with us. He's really funny and he's got chocolate all over his shirt. He is a Zubu Violet. Warm welcome. And his opponent, who's playing his first broadcast game on stage at this tournament, Mon Ami Francais, Millennium Feast. All right, guys, shake hands, good luck, have fun. And I'll let the casters take it from here. Thank you very much, Jared. It's fantastic to be back straight away for another cast as we do yep. have Feast versus Violet. Now, day nine. Yes, Kate Lares, give us the lowdown on the gentleman that is known as Feast. You know, I wanted to give you the lowdown, but to do that, I wanted glasses to remove, and I thought, well, I don't have those. I'm wearing my uh, contacts. So I almost removed my headset for dramatic emphasis, except that what happens... That's right, it doesn't work very well. So I'll go ahead and just tell you about Feast straight up. He is... Uh, been studying a lot with Grubby. They're very much so players with a solid underpinning of good fundamentals. Um, but a lot of times when people say fundamentals, they're referring to uh, keeping your probe count, never missing pylons, never missing macro. In StarCraft II, I'm almost feeling more and more that the most important fundamental is map awareness. Yeah. Knowing where those roaches and links could be coming from, knowing where they are coming from and repositioning properly. And Feast is not only excellent at that, but he also has some really brilliant build preparation. And hair. And hair. I was going to say, hair. that's that's a really, really import, important to emphasize here. His hair is pretty impressive in itself. But not only is that impressive, but his qualification process here was also quite impressive. Instantly, he was qualified through to stage three of the European qualifier uh, because of his such high ranking positionings during the Intel Extreme Masters season number six. Now, Feast, during that qualification process, was able to take out the likes of Nama, Vortex, and Slivko. And Slivko and Vortex had a lot of problems against Feast because in the five games that he played against, two against Vortex, three against Slivko, Every single one was the Immortal push. And well, Slivko beat it, beat, beat it once, but got demolished by it twice in a row. You know, I think of all people to do it against Violet is probably a reasonable choice. Violet is excellent at the, the extended mid game. Again, yep. if you are an aggressive player, you're delaying your own tech to the late game by using mid game units like speed roaches, mutilists, counterattacks, and as a result, delaying your opponent's tech to the late game where the mothership would be, where the big Colossus High Templar armies would yeah. be. I fully expect that what we'll see out of Violet is this Ling Roach aggression into Mutalisk. It's one of his most favorite styles to do. The map, though, is going to be Metropolis. I don't know how Feast plays on huge maps. On smaller uh -huh. maps, he has a lot of two and three base timing pushes, as you said. Yeah, uh, th th there is always that potential from Feast. And, you know, again, there's those real two big extremists on Metropolis. Some people. Uh, like we've been seeing uh, for a lot of this tournament, whenever we end up loading up onto that map, it's this big, massive 50-minute yeah. macro game with oh, yeah. some Ravens involved, I hear. Uh, and then sometimes it can be, again, that very, very strong two-base play. Yeah. The architecture can work really nice with it, especially if you've got a War Prism uh, located very, very close to your opponent's ramp, where you can warp in on the high ground and low ground, nestled right next to your army with good, very co good coverage. Yeah, that is true. The two base timings, like the War Prism, super strong. Also like a lot of blink timings. I'm, not, I'm still unsure if Feast really favors that sort of play, but the map has spawned. So let's go ahead and hop in and introduce our players. Spawning in the right position as the blue Zerg, it is going to be Azubu's Violet. And sporting over to the left-hand side, we do have a Protoss player who made his name at the Intel Extreme Masters, looking to do it once again. Give it up for Millennium's Feast. So, this is the first broadcasted match of the IEM Legend Feast here. And uh, he got, again, he got a lot of attention at the World Championship, uh, World Championship for, at CBIT. And I can, I remember, 
I remember it so well because it was the first big tournament that I was actually casting properly. Um, and just sat at the casting desk as Feast was being interviewed after his loss with MMA, which eliminated him from God, the tournament. that was such a nail-biter. Yeah, that really was. But the problem, well, I mean, I could go on about that series forever, actually. But <laughs> it, I just remember this iconic picture of Feast giving this interview, and so many people gathered around the desk taking photos of him, so proud that he was able to push forwards as the last foreigner to be able to be in the tournament. It was, oh, it was such a cool sight to see. And you know, I'm just so excited also that we're getting the chance to see Feast play because even with his skills being as high as they are, there's almost too many tournaments for players to physically handle in terms of travel, so they kind of have to yeah. choose where they really play, and IEM is where Feast has chose to focus. So here at Gamescom, in Season 7, the inaugural event of Season 7, Feast showing us some nice little micro moves, still hasn't built that pylon. Oh my god, this is the <laughs> most annoying thing in the universe. Oh, oh. third time. Can he get it for fourth? He can. Oh, look. Oh. <laughs> the three health probe. <laughs> Did you see how many minerals he had? He had 500 minerals stocked up during that entire process. So oh, a gosh. slight little bit of tension there in Violet's build. But again, you know, as you were saying, you know, you have to be selective about the tournaments that you end up going to. Feast uh, was one of the favorites to go in and win WCS Belgium. Uh, however, he was not able to actually participate because of his studies. Now. Since then, he's actually been able to finish up his studies and is now focusing on this. He's had a little bit of a uh, lack of presence here for a while, but coming into the qualifying stages, he ripped it apart. And he is looking in Season 7 of the Intel Extreme Masters to come back and turn some heads once again. Feast certainly already turning my head quite a bit in this match with that excellent micro. Look at this probe that's been at three health, checking up on that. He sees it at 415 going down. He now knows the exact count of units that his opponent can possibly have. Any earlier than that is just not actually possible. So the only situation that Violet could be in is a gasless Zerg spot. And look at this probe hiding all the way down here. Ah. In terms of the scout timing, I like to do something around 630. Mm -hmm. That's when you can really get a good sense if there's units coming, whether you really need to be doing that extra rewalling off at the front. Feast is probably going to be doing the Zealot Stalker push, also for a little bit of scouting intel. Yeah, I've seen Feast once or twice actually just lead this probe down here, even to the point where he just wants to go for that immortal push. I mean, again, I'm not, I don't want to hark on about it too much. I, he may not end up going for that, but during the qualification process, he literally used it every map, which was <laughs> just, and it had. A, a lot, a lot of success. So we'll see what he wants to go for. Uh, he still has so many options open to him here. And again, Metropolis, one of those maps that really allows a wealth of options. Metropolis is such a sweet map. I mean, yeah. the, the only issue I would say I have with the map is that sometimes you can get to like the 25 minute mark and no one's attacked and everyone's still building defenses and expanding and you're like, oh no, I'm casting <laughs> this game. I'm just gonna start telling stories You're about casting a painting, not an actual game. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, there's the 545 timing on the assimilators. Or I guess a little closer to six minutes starting those. Either way, looks a lot like our good friend, the two base push. It's all gonna come down to whether he goes three gates and then a Twilight Council or the Robo. Oh, there it is, gate one, two, three. And a Robo, or excuse me, a Twilight Council shall be following this up shortly. Every so often you'll see a Robo, but I, I, I don't like that very much. He really should be going Twilight Council. Yeah, the Robo would have been a lot earlier from here, I feel, so. For now, we'll be sticking along with this. Three gateways going down here. I mean, he, uh, even still here, he has so many options. He could quite easily use these gates for that pressure, like we were talking about before, or could just use them for the macro to be able to establish himself that third base very, very quickly here. Now, one of the aspects that really categorizes Feast is the speed at which he plays. He is just hand motion-wise, it's not actually showing too much here, but he just... Whenever you watch him on his keyboard, he is dancing away with his hands. There's, a, again, a very, very yeah. strong video of him at the World Championship where you're just seeing him just spam away, and it's, it's really, really quite interesting to watch. It looks like it is going to be that two-base timing push from Feast. Very excited to see how it will play out as we see the extremely fast layer. This will allow Violet to get up an extremely fast roach speed, which is one of those pivotal necessities against this push. But I wanted to come back to that speed point you were making earlier, that 
th there's a certain kind of speed that you just can't really measure. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like I can box workers like this or I can box them quickly. And I mean, Feast does every action super fast. Even something as, as simple as just like sending a unit over here, it's just click, bam, instantly perfect accuracy. It's a real treat to watch live. Yeah, there's so much flow in every single move that he does. And again, I don't want to I don't want to overuse that, but it, it, there really is that flow that does occur in his control. So, for now, he's going to move out with uh, so many sentries here and um, no roach speed yet. Oh, uh -oh. Jalaris, he doesn't he didn't get speed for roaches and now we see the mega army moving forward for feast. He's already demonstrated where he wants to attack from. It's going to be from the south. This could be very, very scary indeed. He's going to use the sentries to constantly zone out these units, and then once they've all dissipated their energy, then start using the blink to be really, really defensive with that control of the stalkers. And he's going to try and save some of these pylons. But it looks like Violet is forced to target down one of the pylons. The sentries do not wish to waste any of their force fields. There's the rewarp in. Violet knows exactly where this push is coming from, but Probe needs to start building those extra pylons. Yeah. I mean, Unless Feast can reinforce right at the front lines, he is not going to be going very far in this match. And there's a really money pylon placement. He can warp up into the main, the double pylon to ensure it can happen. But Roach speed painfully far behind. And the problem with this map for Violet is that exactly that. Force fields on this map so good because of how narrow some of these paths really, really are. These roaches very, very separated from the ones in the back, not doing too much damage from the back there at all. And for now, he still has so much energy left on these. Um, an offensive blink in, which is a very ballsy play there for Feast, but it actually pays off. God, that is such a bold blink forward by Feast, but he now is in an excellent position. He's already pulled the drones, Day Knight. Oh my God, Violet is feeling really upset at this point in time. He is feeling on the verge of losing right away. Feast brilliantly morphs in another two sentries. He's going to have to replenish some with Zealots, but he's starting to realize that with those drones pulled off, he doesn't actually need to push in and do damage. He needs to buy time forcing Violet to lose more and more and more and more cash. The sentries will help do that, and there's the split. Oh. Brilliantly getting just a few units, and oh my <laughs> god, Feast is just wrecking Violet in this game one. Oh, not only that, but the majority of those were drones anyway, so he still has quite a lot of energy left over here. Guardian Shield went up to be able to negate as much of the damage from these roaches, and now just a few roaches still separated in the back here. He still has that defensive blink capability to make these stalkers so cost-effective going up against this composition for Violet. Look. Oh my god, that unit's lost. Tab K Lars oh. is just telling the whole story. The excellent slow two base play from Feast is just picking Violet apart. There's virtually nothing that Violet can do. The speed is done for the Roaches, but we're seeing oh. another really ballsy blink forward from Feast. And slowly but surely, Feast is making his way to the core of Violet's base. Confidence exuding from him with that forced forward blink there. Now he's using it in a defensive capabilities. Blink so versatile going into this big two base play. And there you go, GG. GG. Feast. Feast is up 1-0 against one of the best PVZers on the planet. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> you, you're completely right. I mean, you don't just do this to Violet and say, well, I'm an average Protoss, I'm going to do it. Because <laughs> Violet shuts this down hard most of the time. But Feast comes along, he has control that is just exceptional. And again, Metropolis, with that force field control early on, the, these narrow, narrow paths are very, very difficult for Violet to really traverse. Yeah, I mean, Feast, I just think, was so brilliant in how slowly he did that push forward. Yeah. Often you'll see players who go for that seven gate, two base blink play, only building six sentries. Mm. They want to conserve the gas to get as many blink stalkers as possible, but we saw 10 out of uh, Feast. He ended up being forced essentially to build some extra zealots just to have some units made instead of nothing because he had no more gas remaining. However, yeah. with that really slow set of force fields, it was just three or four force fields picking off six roaches. Another three or four force fields just picking off some zerglings. And then just clearly got into a good spot when he saw the drones pulled off. I mean, that's actually a pretty hard set of decisions to make from Feast to play that slow. And then those yeah. blink forwards with everything, oh. that is the way to instantly lose. But Feast <laughs> chose is. literally the only two windows in the game to do it. Yeah, and it really worked out for him. He, you know, those extra blink forwards, 
you know, they killed one or two roaches. And every unit counts massively at that point for the Zerg because of the way in which Force Fields is just able to rip up that Zerg force. So we are going to be moving on to game number two here in just a second. Um, what map are we going to be on going on to? I mean, Daybreak, the expected choice for Violet. Again, the maneuver he likes is to do the, the heavy Ling with some speed roaches, but then transition into Ling Mutalisk. He loves Ling Mutalisk play. This map's beautiful for it. But this is also starting to become the Protoss special build map. We've seen Oz do a one-gate triple Nexus play. We've been seeing uh, Inori do his DT rush triple Nexus play. We've also seen the dreaded two base immortal push warp prism play, which can never really be bad on any map. But um, I, I do think, though, that Feast should have some sort of special three base play planned. Yeah. I'd hope to see uh, an, an emphasis on Blink Stalkers, Warp Prisms, Dark Templar, but um, Feast does tend to be a little bit more on his timing push style play as of, as of these days. He does, and it's ridiculously strong. It's, yeah. it's, it's ground down to the very second. Well, I mean, that could be a bit of an overstatement. The very second might be a little bit uh, strong there, but it's very, very methodical, very, very kind of well thought out, and from there, again, I'm going to say another two-base play. Feast, it, it just yeah. works for him. Why fix what's broken? Yeah, I mean, it looks like the game has Not now broken. been unpaused. We'll get the chance to go into it. Down in the bottom left from Belgium and Team Millennium, it is Beast. And spawning up to the top right hand corner once again, 1 0 down in a series. He needs your support, guys. Give it up for Azubu's Violet. You know, I, I will say, I mean, we were getting a chance to talk a little bit about this earlier on, but uh, Feast is doing kind of the same builds that everyone else is doing, but he's doing yeah. them a little bit better, but way more importantly, having much better in battle decision making, much better. Again, positional awareness, knowing where the units can be fr coming from, how to move his army to account from that, and still have the warp in pads. Those pylons were very threatened yep. in that first game, but Feast managed to get himself set up nicely to defend it. Oh, that's very, very true indeed. As you know, Feast, it, it, it's interesting the wall that we actually had there from Feast to kick that game off. He actually had, normally you would see a Protoss just have a one hex space to be able to wall things off. But he was so confident in his ability to be able to deal with what was going on. They even had a two hex space there. No doubt to, you yeah. know, throw a pile on down if you saw some kind of aggression coming along, which could always, you know, bolster that wall very, very nicely. But it's still a risky play to go for if you're not keeping full awareness and eyes yeah. on your minimap. I mean, that, that it's a very specific trade-off that Feast is making by having the two hex opening. Yeah. It obviously is a lot harder to block off with just a zealot. You need the building. But at the same time, it also allows you to make a double thick wall off in case of emergencies. With that single <laughs> slit, you can really only do a one extra backup wall off. Again, with this nice dance. And look, this Violet's adjustment is to actually bring yeah. drone two. Exactly. That was so neat for Violet there. Adjusting from one game to the next really does show the level at which Violet plays. Just He doesn't want to have to have five. 500 minerals backed up like he had on Metropolis. That is not a good place to be in as a Zerg player. Yeah, I mean, Feast doing magnificent little manipulation there. But in this game, Feast is seeing, you know, I haven't really done any dramatic damage. I'm just seeing where my opponent's at. This is a nice little place to hide the probe. I haven't really seen that. This tends to be the most typical place yeah. to hide probes nowadays because it's very easy for a Zergling to walk right by it. Uh, but Feast is building a kind of way far back photon cannon that actually doesn't protect this mm. upper pylon from roaches. Yeah, that can be very, very dicey indeed. Uh, and Violet, you know, he, he can mix it up and go for the roaches, but I think um, as time goes on right now, more and more of Zergs are really adopting that very kind of heavy Ling Infester style going on into the mid game. But uh, again, he has to have those roaches in place to be able to deal what Feast can throw at him being, you know, just this crazy two-base aggression that Feast is so well known for. Yeah. Feast now scouting ahead. This is the big indicator. Boom. It's going to be that third base for Violet. Pretty much as expected. There's no reason not to go three base on this map. A lot of people, I think, would agree that it's a little silly. To, I'm going to choose Daybreak. Let's all in. <laughs> That's... <laughs> 
That's yeah. overthinking things a little bit. If you want to all in, yeah. choose Ohana, choose something that's a little bit smaller, but Feast doing everything as typically expected. And again, around 545 is when Zergs really start keeping the hawk's eye on those Vespine gas geysers. Yeah, and that's always very, very important to keep an eye on because just say, for example, your opponent's missing one gas geyser at that natural, and they're actually powering off three gas geysers. That in itself is a huge, huge tell of what they're going to be doing and the options available to them on that two-base kind of play. Yeah. That really does tend to be, for instance, a more of a blink-ish focused play, a blink with maybe uh, no robo in this sort of style, or just a sort of light attempt to take a third base. If you're yeah. going to see no gas here, it's either crazy aggression or a very fast third. If you see two gas there, you better have defense up because you're going to have a <laughs> timing push coming at you at 10 minutes with either Robo or the Blink Tech involved in there as well. All these are significant possibilities, and I'm quite surprised to see Violet sending this Overlord in, having not gotten that information from this, these gas geysers yet. Yeah, uh, so for now, that Roach Warren will be on the way. He's going to actually move in here with an Overlord, see if anything is on the way, but nothing right now in the main. And with that warp, uh, actually, he's kind of boosting out sentries here and trying to clear. Wow, that is a very quick third nexus here. As expected on this map, this is really where you've got to have some sort of magical build planned. What? And this is the absolutely correct follow-up from Feast, going for a Stargate. How can you defend an early third nexus? Well, what can Zerg throw at you? Zerglings or Roaches or Banelings? nothing else. He's actually going to be building a Photon Cannon here and walling this off with gateways on all sides to deal with the Zergling threat. And then, from the Stargate, can't really do anything special with Phoenixes. He's going to be going double Void Ray and then just holding on double Void Ray. But this is a nice little ad added pressure from Beast to be able to um, pick off at the third. Yeah, I'm sort of... How many ev evolution champions do we have on? Just the one, uh, complementing that Roach Warrant for now. I can't help but feel that maybe Violet is just going to play that really, really quick max out style and try and just break things before the air units can actually fully get that DPS out and down on the ground. But again, there is always the potential. Ah, there, there we go. He does have a second evolution chamber planned out here. So a bit more of a longer game focus here from Violet for now. I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed, honestly, that Violet has not scattered this expansion. That's so classic. No yeah. gas by seven minute. Well, he's either going really aggressive or he's taking a fast third. Wait a minute. I haven't seen the aggression yet. And it's nine minutes. Mm. Where's the scout? Look at Violet go getting here painfully late. This pylon and cannon are walled off from the gateways. So there's no, there's no worry about the fact that this is... Well, this is an Artosis pylon. But th that and that's a really safe cannon. I've, I've never quite seen too many safe cannons quite like that one. Nestled nicely in there between the gateways and the nexus, just to be able to prevent, you know, Zerglings from getting good Zerg's area, mm -hmm. if any. <laughs> These Void Rays are in a little bit of the wrong spot. They need to be at the watchtowers. Checking at the fourth is fine. Putting pressure at one of these bases is a the biggest blunder you can make with this opening. These Void Rays have to stay at home. We're starting to see Violet power up. Violet's getting his macro hatch. He's getting an infestation pit. You have the freedom as Violet to straight tech right now. You have the freedom to go straight for the hive. The trick to do in Violet's position is actually to go hive and corruptor and then get the infestors later on. Because what pressure can your opponent who went this fast of a three base really apply to you? Only air. That's how you get the corruptors in there. Yep, and uh, Beast for now just stockpiling quite a bit of gas uh, on these six gas guys here to be able to keep that tech going. Robo going down as well as Twilight Council here, so spreading himself on uh, multiple fronts in terms of tech to be able to just continue things going on and actually even get that drone as well as the cancellation on the fourth there to be able to constantly just hold Violet back for now. Kind of cool fact from Beast, he's already hit 73 drones, excuse me, 73 probes. Wow. He doesn't actually need to build any more probes. He's already gotten what he needs to. He's also just started to morph these warp gates up. Has started to get himself his observer produced. He has the two robos. There's a robo bay going down. A fourth base is the correct play right now for Feast to just take that up because again, if you see a whole bunch of Ling, um, a whole bunch of Ling Infester, not really a big threat to try to take down a fourth, especially if you're going to be able to get Colossus up in a second. Yeah, very, very true. And, uh, you know, it's always very scary as a Zerg when your opponent is allowed to get up a third. 
uh, uh, Protoss is allowed to get up a third this quickly and this freely because the amount of economy they have as fast as you and constantly denying this fourth over and over gets a little bit scary and there the response for the hive and the spire going down at the 12 minute mark it's really really important to tech up equally as fast so you can have that composition out by the time your protoss opponent gets to that very very comp scary composition as well i mean i can't believe i'm going to say this but that 12 minute hive is quite late from violet in this position you're sure it, right. It really needs to be like a 1030 hive if you want to be going for a hive. Because right now we're about to see feast. What is it? There's oh. six gateways here. It looks like there's going to be another few up here. There's about 11 gateways on the map right now. So there's going to be a tremendous Blink Stalker warp in that can easily crush down the front door seconds before those Broodlords pop up, which is the most vulnerable spot for Zergi. And not only that, but it's that Naniwa-esque double robotics facility, double Colossus production so fast to the point where he's going to get four Colossus very, very rapidly without his opponent actually initially realizing. So that can always be a massively scary factor, whilst Feast really doesn't have her too much intel on the tech. Sorry, whilst Violet doesn't have too much intel on the tech of Feast. Feast now has the money mix up to defend the fourth. There's the good old Nine Stalker warping. And I think, I think Violet might be getting a little bit of a lucky break here. He hasn't been, uh, had any pressure applied. Here begins the 90 second countdown to being able to start those Broodlords. Broodlords still will be popping up at around 1630. Plenty of time for peace for Feast to push. But the eight Corruptors are the real danger. All these spine crawlers haven't been constructed yet, and Feast oh. is about to hit at the key time. Yeah, he's maxing out at the, almost exactly the same time as Violet is. How many times do you see this happen? He's going to blink into a, a, creating himself a bigger concave here, creating a much better uh, actual arc of attack uh, against this location. And uh, for now, if he pushes in and just pokes away Ooh. at these spine crawlers, it could be very deadly. Where are the corruptors? There, they're fi they're finally starting to make their way to the front lines. An incredible arc for Feast. Force fields trapping Whoa. everything perfectly. The Void Ray's absorbing most of the damage from those Corruptors. Violet trying to find an angle. He does manage to sneak a lot of those Zerglings in. Almost all the Force fields have been expended. After this moment, Violet is now starting to conquer this front line. How did he pull oh. this off? Violet with an incredible recovery and decimating this attack. Oh, wow. Those fungal growths coupled with the surface area the Lynx were able to provide themselves with was phenomenal there by Violet. Right now, Feast on the retreat here. He still has that fourth base up, but I don't know if it's going to be up for much longer if Violet actually wanted to pressure that. I cannot believe that Violet was able to take that out, but, you know, that really shows you the danger of attacking at a wide angle. All the force fields were gone in the first two volleys. The excellent, excellent fungal growths trapped the sentries at the front, and once those were picked off, it was a bunch of stalkers getting surrounded by lings. The corruptors in the middle getting eaten alive. I mean, the corruptors weren't even able to be target fired down by any of the stalkers. Yeah, that was pretty brutal there for Feast, and now we do have those seven Broodlords going to be morphing in in just a little second here. 3-3 three, three going to be going down for the Lings and Broodlings as well, so Violet's going to have a very, very nice amount of upgrades, but there's four Colossus. They're not having any of that aggression over at the fourth. God, there's a lot of Broodlords on the map, just super suddenly for Violet, but gosh, did he get those up just at the right time. I mean... If Feast had had that range just 15, 20 seconds sooner, the Wall of Spines would have been obliterated. And I think whilst we've spoken a lot, a lot about Feast, a lot about history, history and stuff like that, we this is what Violet does. Violet is a formidably strong player. He's taken first places at MLG, at MSI Battlegrounds that you might have had the chance to host there. And look at this, he's going to be able to pressure with a very, very strong army. Since there's no more force fields, Feast is replacing those with Zealots, trying to let them take the front lines, and it is working very well. The number of Colossi at the back is staggering. Finally, the front line of ground units has evaporated, but still, there's just not oh. enough units to deal with the Broodlords. Oh. 106 Zerglings in production. He just wants to barrel oh down on this. God. And he has the big beefy units in place that he doesn't need to replenish. So he's just going to replenish with all his there's the oh. Link starting to one-shot those Broodlords. Now they're falling. The excellent fungal growth. Not quite enough. Here come 106 Zerglings. It's going to have to be all the Colossus. But it looks like Violet is starting to run directly underneath all those units. Not that many Broodlords left on the map. The Colossus in an excellent position. But 
I mean, this is a real nail biter. How do you get an yeah. edge as either player in this spot? Well, as Violet, you've got to go back. You've got to rebuild those mega forces. We see again the fungals from Violet landing just perfectly and an excellent angle Ooh. for those Colossi to start roasting units. What bold blink forwards by Feast, but correct ones nonetheless. Yeah, Violet behind this has tried to establish himself a fifth down to the bottom right hand corner here. The only problem I see from Feast is he's not making that transition to the fleet. Where is that? Has he got a fleet beacon yet? I don't really see it anywhere. I mean, Mothership isn't the end all and be all, but it's certainly really damn useful going up against this kind of com uh, co uh, composition. Yeah, I mean, now with all these Zerglings on the map, Violet is starting to say, ah, you know, I don't quite have enough left over to get those Broodlords, but you know what? Broodlords might not be the best choice. I'll just max out on Corruptor, Infester, Zergling, and overrun this Colossus Stalker force. Feast is basically going for an extended mid-game. Colossus Stalker, not exactly the late game composition. You want to have those Templar, those Archons, that mothership. A blink forward, an excellently positioned blink forward. We're starting to see all the Corruptors eat those Colossus for breakfast. The Zergling numbers are getting equally low, but now as the uh, Infestor count is also starting to slowly dwindle, this is where Feast needs to ask himself, what can I possibly build right now? Violet has just cleared out my Colossus, and that's soon going to be... Oh, oh! Zergling's picked off the Nexus in the midst of the attack. That was a really, really nice play there by Phyla. Even I, actually, I didn't see that at all, I must admit, as <laughs> we will be able to try and work on these rocks for now, but Violet's still cruising up to that max supply count. Seven more Broodlords on the way right now. And does Feast really have the economy to be able to go up against this kind of composition right now? It's... I don't oh, know God. I mean, it, it was really to Violet's credit. Violet said, what is the real problem I'm going to have if I want to go and fester a Broodler? Well, yeah. the problem is those six damn Colossi. So <laughs> let me do an attack to kill off those, oh. and then I'll start going Broodlords. The Zerglings are out of position. The Broodlords under assailment by these Stalkers, but the Zerglings spring in from the oh. back and feast despite his perfectly executed build, his perfectly executed timing attack. Violet, too good in the matchup. <laughs> One of the most impressive games I've ever seen out of Violet. Yeah, that was extremely, extremely well played. That it's easy to crumble under the pressure of, you know, again, a Protoss taking that very, very fast third base, allowing them to just, you know, he sat back pretty much and let Protoss do what he wanted for a long time during that game. But behind that, in the midst of everything that was happening there, he was also doing just what he wanted yep. to do and uh, showed there that it really did work out. I mean, if you're in Feast position, you actually think to yourself, I got to do my build exactly. I wasn't messed with. I wasn't thrown off. I got everything up. I delayed his fourth. I mean, I honestly think that if Feast had just angled himself a little bit more solidly in that big push at 15 minutes, that is where he could have secured himself that advantage and won. But just getting into a too wide of a position once against Violet is all it takes. Yeah, Violet's the kind of player that's going to be able to spring on that opportunity. He is, he is an opportunist, in essence. <laughs> the, I, mean, yeah. the, I think that's a great way to describe his Zerg style, actually. Yeah, yeah he, like for the longest time, we would see Violet just scout like Terrence, for example, see the front slightly exposed, instantly throw down a Roach and instantly go bailing next, yeah, try to yeah. bust up the ramp. And the opportunistic style that we see from Violet transitions very, very nicely onto those key small mistakes that your opponent's going to make, slight overextensions, being able to run in there, get good surrounds, yeah. and that is Violet to a T. And now, with the last map being Cloud Kingdom, this is very much so the opportunist map. There's so many different attack paths, yeah. counter-attack paths, expanding patterns. This is where we see Violet truly shine. If Feast moves out and doesn't protect the third, or actually, if Feast even does protect the third, but doesn't protect an attack path to the third, Violet will still make that push, still do massive damage, and Feast will be thinking, uh, do I try to take out this fourth extraneous base for Zerg, or do I save my critical third base? This is what happens. These are the decisions that Violet puts onto his opponents. It's very true. So without further ado, we shall be loading up into this third game here in just a second. 1-1 one, one currently, and I think that's a very apt result right now. Both of these players very evenly matched. There's Feast, mm -hmm. who can bring those big, big power plays. Again, if you look at those two games, he might 
say, hey, well, I won in the first game with that kind of play, um, you know, that kind of big two base play. And actually, Cloud Kingdom is a really good map for that kind of play if your opponent's going to be taking that third at a standard time because of the way in which the architecture works around that third. And now, let us introduce our two players spawning down in the bottom left-hand corner with a brilliant series of build orders in games one and two. He's going to need amazing execution to win in game three. It is Millennium's Feast. And spawning up to the top right-hand corner, originally from Korea, but moving over to the USA. He's going to be spawning here as our Blueser. Give it up for Azubu's Violet. So again, Cloud Kingdom, pretty good for those two base plays. Feast was able to prevail with in game one with a two base play, wasn't able to prevail in game two with a macro play. I think we are going to be seeing some two base strong tactics here from Feast. Now, Feast does have the option of doing the gateway first play. That's a very yeah. uh, popular hyper modern build, but. Beast, I don't think, needs to do any sort of adjustment. He's felt his own strength in games one and two and can easily just say, ah, I had a control mishap. He was even saying that in the uh, chat before the game. Whoops, I left two Colossus when I went to do that mistake. What a blunder. And Violet thanked him profusely for making said blunder. <laughs> he but, did. So on this map, I would expect Beast still to do some sort of standard uh, expand play. And honestly, this is one where the one gate expand, the exact build that we saw in the last map, is also quite effective. Oh, or the Nexus first on the 17 Forge. It looks like it's going to be Nexus first here for Love Feast. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Especially considering he was actually sharking around in his opponent's base, seeing that spawning pool timing, know that there's no real imminent threat of Zerglings being super gung-ho aggressive, and uh, we'll be able to get that going. Feast now at the front of his base. Is it going to be Gateway? It's going to be no pylon at the front. And oh my gosh, I think Feast is actually just going to instant pylon here. If he does, that's another way of saying I want to go for a very fast robo push. Double pylon block is one of the big keys to making that build maximally effective. Yeah, uh, so he does go throw down the forge for now. He will, he has the money to be able to throw down the pylon. He blocks it once again, but abandons the hope as that expansion goes down. But he's still blocking that natural. Yeah, I mean, get it, letting that pylon finish is a nice way to do these chrono boosts and get past 20 supply. Yeah. Uh, so for now, Battle Lords keeping a good eye on everything that's going on here. Just having a little bit of a look-see as that cannon. Actually, wait, that's a pylon, not a cannon. Okay, so just wants to get as many probes out as possible. And uh, the proton cannon now goes down after pylon. And the Zerglings are actually on the way, so you probably will end up needing to throw down a building or even just putting a probe there for now. So Feast has the nice spacing opportunity to be able to wall this off with another pylon, and there it is, but this is actually... I'm not sure if that's covered, but ah. certainly the Zerglings will get maximum surface area. All will be able to attack. The pylon is done, but uh, I think Violet is still just going to run uh -oh. in. Yeah. I Here think comes the cancel. <laughs> and Violet, again, can Probe's like, can I've got this, man. Probe's fine. Probe's fine. He's, he's, fine. he's got it. As we will have maybe Zella on the way, and Cybernetics Core going to go down here, just out of the range of that Overlord. Uh, so, I mean, obviously the Cybernetics Core is going to end up going down, but it's always nice to have your opponent not have vision of that initially. So maybe you can get like one or two Chrono Boosts on that sneakily without them seeing it. And Chrono Boosts early on are pretty important uh, for Protoss to be able to allocate them in the correct locations. Yeah, a Violet is seeing the Chrono Boost going down on the Nexus. Yeah. At this point in time, you generally stop uh, chrono boosting the nexuses, especially this chrono boost right here. This this would not be going down for a lot of mega, mega, mega big timing pushes. Feast now with this cybernetics core finishing up. We see there's, oh, we're starting to see the components for some sort of a very early push. He just needs to take both these gas geysers around now to finalize the preparations. Mm. And I like what Violet's doing to prepare himself. He's uh -huh. getting that creep spread going more adamantly at his third location than he is anywhere else. And with that robo facility going down, uh, well, I mean, if he makes an observer first, of course, I think it's going to be some kind of expansion play. But again, if we see some uh, Chrono Boost saved up here for some kind of immortal play, then it can get a little bit dicey for Violet. This is looking like an expand play from Feast. No geysers here, no plus one here. 
not a strong way to do a two base timing push. So I would anticipate that this pro might pull back, throw down this expansion, even on a one gate, one robo. There's the two uh, assimilators going down to help do a little bit of reinforcing this. Violet, I think, is going to be doing the exact play that he has really shown to be his favorite. He's talked about it being his favorite play, both on camera and just off camera. He likes Mutalane in this matchup. We've seen him do a ton of Mutalane in this matchup. Yeah. And in this setup, he's getting his early layer up. Not going to be uh, up against an early attack, so I'm kind of expecting Mutalane. Yeah, and I, I agree with your assessment of those gas timings. Yeah, because if you want to go for that really, really heavy two base play, I mean, he's got the Chrono Boost out. Uh, the initial Immortal, just for a little bit there, but he isn't spending any more Chrono Boost on it, and he's actually going for a Zealot instead of the uh, Sentry that's just there. But you really want so much gas, but actually he's getting a second Immortal out as well here. Um, you want that gas early, basically, to be able to say, well, I want a lot of Sentries with this. Wait. Which is very, very is important. Beast really doing this? I... Okay, well, he's stopping at six total. This is still an expansion-oriented play. You can bait going for a push and get your, the expansion up. But the layer's already been started for Violet. I think the layer's are already almost uh -oh. done. With that third Immortal on the way, Sean, I, 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 we said it at the very, very beginning of the series, and now he's kind of thrown us off a little bit with the timings on those gases, but it looks like he might be going for this kind of play. And actually, he's got a little bit of gas being saved up here to be able to add on a few more sentries. But this is going to be slightly more sentry light than it would have been had those gases gone down beforehand. Now we could see, uh, well, there's yeah, the War there Prism go. going down, but still, this is just not a good mixture if you want to be doing this big push. Violet right now getting up all his essential pieces. Speed for Zerglings is done. That's the biggest key to being able to deflect this kind of push. Yeah. Now, normally at this point in the move out here, you would see 12 sentries with these three immortals. We only have nine sentries with this, so that's the timing of that 300 gas is evident in those gas timings. So Feast is moving out and he's getting that Observer all along as well to be able to just spot any kind of Burrow Roach timings that would be coming out to be able to defend this. But Violet, he knows this is coming now and he's going to be preparing avidly at that third base. In the unit timings, we see that there's 54 drones. Violet has had the perfect amount of drones to deal with this attack. This should not be a particularly difficult uh, task. Well, actually, it should be a difficult task for Violet, but not the way it usually is for Zergs. And we see Violet starting to press forward. He's hitting them from that front side. Decent force fields just help buy a little bit more time. And yet again, the deflection, the denial of that reinforcement is what makes Violet so good. I can't. This is, this is really going to be hard for Feast to break. I mean, as the more and more time that goes on here for Violet, the more units he's going to be getting. And he has those two spine collars to back him up as well. So these force fields need to be literally pristine to be able to actually take this engagement. He's properly. at the right angle. Those are the force fields oh. that he needs thus far. But there's Zerglings coming in from the backside. Feast is floating close to 1K resources. And this is the re uh, Why does he have just six gateways in this push? This is such a difficult attack to do with just six. And there we see the attack in from the back. Feast is really going to start to run out of force fields here. He needs to go into phasing and start microing like his heart. Oh, oh my god, he's starting to get the good warp ins. And Violet, amazingly, Feast, how did Feast micro that well? He's been doing the lift land on the warp prism. And now with these zealots warping in, I think Feast may oh have done god. it. Oh my god, he's such good micro with that War Prism and the Immortal, saving them for so long. Now, yeah, again, with the pincered attack from Violet, it's not, the force fields were fantastic, but it's the longevity that we're concerned about here for Feast to constantly continue doing this. But again, he's killed seven workers, and oh, now the wow. hatchery acting like a huge force field as well, separating so many of those roaches. The Violet knows he's in a little bit of trouble there, so had to relocate himself, but for now, Feast continuing to push on forwards. Feast really needed that damn seventh gateway. Look at his money. Oh. He's at 1,100, but still, with his excellent micro, he's making up for the deficit. And there's the seventh gateway going down right now. And as Feast is advancing forward, Violet is starting to get close to losing this third base. But I don't know how far behind Violet is at this point. He's finally starting to step forward with his Roach Force. And oh. amazingly, Violet may have been able to defend this push. 
Right now, Feast trying to micro his heart out. He's picking up as many of these units as he can. Nice save on that one immortal there. As one has already fallen, two of those roaches pushing forward. Gosh. The problem here for here, Feast, though, he has no more force fields. There's no energy left on these entries at all. He needs to be very, very careful about constantly pushing forward. He knows Violet is still restricted to those two bases, and he's going to try and keep going as long as he can. 16, 1,700 resources for Feast. One more warp in round is what he needs. He's now getting up that extra gateway. Seven are up. It's 90 versus 106, but both of them basically have the same army supply. Violet now bringing the remainder of those queens up to the front, and it looks like Violet realizes if he defends just one more attack, he can win. There is that possibility, very, very much so, as if he's able to just save this hat trait, he can start again with that drone production, and he's going to push in oh, here. There's a few not enough force fields. fields. Oh, the whole army slips through a crack at the south side, and this is exactly what Violet has been looking for this entire series of attack long. But this lift drop micro from Beast is phenomenal, and he loses oh. the war prism, and I don't believe it. Violet has defended this, and well done, GG! Violet! with some phenomenal defensive capabilities there, bringing the thunder to Feast here in game at number three, powering him down. Feast looked in good position to be able to take that at one point or another, wow. but Violet bringing it out, that was a phenomenal defense. I mean, the defense was amazing, but I, I have to bring up again, with only six gateways, yes the money kept slowly climbing throughout. And if you envision just one more gateway having gone down with that initial set, that attack actually began at the 10 minute mark and ended at the 15 minute mark. That's almost 10 full warp in rounds. Even if you've got just eight extra stalkers in the midst of all that, that's plenty to be able to have tipped the tide into the favor of Feast. But either way, Feast is really showing that in all three games had a different, unique build style yep. that performed just so close to winning in games two and three, but God, Violet is resilient. Yeah, really is. Really making a good situation in his favor there. And I, I have to echo, it, echo those sentiments. He had so much money banked up. And again, imagine if he'd have had an extra three centuries in that composition where it's the, normally the 12 oh. centuries that push out with those three immortals. I think he was maybe playing a little bit of mind games with Violet there, saying, yeah. hey, these gases aren't going down at the normal time. So, you know, you can just you know, go for your lair, just be fine, drone up a little harder than you normally would do. But it, it didn't pay off for him in the end, unfortunately. Yeah, it's one of those things where e even considering mind games in general, it's always more important just to have good timings and to have those extra units. Yeah, Whether yeah. you tricked your opponent into building more drones or not, having six extra force fields is a good thing, right? You yeah. just want to have a lot of force fields with that push. What we're still seeing, though, is the Immortal Sentry Stalker composition is so tough for Zergs to deal with. Almost always Zergs will, will go up to 60, 65 drones and have barely a chance to be able to stay alive, even at 55 drones, where Violet stopped very early and built way more Ling Roach. He had just enough. It was all micro for Violet's part. I mean, yeah. Feast had the most incredible force fields, most incredible patience. Huge props to Violet. And that micro only aided more and more by that little extra bit of creep spread that he had around the third. I mean, yes, a lot of Zergs are doing that anyway to be able to just really kind of have that massive, massive defensive capability in that area anyway. But it's one of the attributes that can sometimes go unnoticed, but is vitally, vitally important. Oh, yes. Oh, you need that speed <laughs> to be able to stay alive. So that does mean Feast is 1-2 in Group B. Violet is 2-1 in Group B, and your other results are still being determined as players are playing their matches out. Yeah, so I think we may end up, or may not have an interview on the stage. Yes, we will. This is Jared Kale. Good to go. As I slightly move my chair yeah, out of the way to have a look. Let's see up on the main stage of Jared's there. I'm standing here with our winner, Azubu Violet. Just had a, an incredibly close ZBP. Yeah. How do you feel? I feel like Protoss or Imba. <laughs> yeah, Protoss. <laughs> well, in the in the right hands, I guess it can be. Um, is there anything you want to say to your fans? You, you speak good English. Um, this this event, uh, first time with my sponsor Azubu, 
I tried my best and for Azubu and I tried my best for a good game, you guys. So keep cheering me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck in your next games. And before I go on, I, I want to make a quick correction. When I brought out Feast last time, uh, I said mon ami français. There was a slight miscommunication where he thought I asked if he spoke French. I meant to ask where he was from. He is, in fact, Belgian. And having some Belgian friends of my own, I know how they feel about being called French. My humblest apologies to the very beautiful country of Belgium. OK? And now that I'm humbled, uh, we're going to cut to a quick, quick commercial break and then come back with Feast again, this time versus the demigod Nesti.